All right, you're not 641. That's later. Well, welcome back, everybody. Good to see you're all surviving and that you're all here. It's like we're going to have an absolutely gorgeous week ahead of us, huh? Thank you, Twitch. I know I'm streaming. It's barely surviving. Yep. Hopefully... Hopefully things end up okay. So, today we have another design pattern to talk about. This is going to be the visitor pattern. Um, we'll have an in-class assignment towards the end today, so I don't know that we'll get through much more than the visitor pattern. Um, today, it's going to be fairly complicated to explain, just as a forewarning. Um, this one is getting into the behavioral side of things and takes a little bit of getting your head wrapped around it. It's going to leverage some of those nifty object-oriented paradigms that hopefully, hopefully you're at least somewhat comfortable with from intro to Java. It leverages some nifty things. So we're going to look at it in more of a clinical language independent fashion, I suppose. But it's pretty, pretty handy design pattern. Um, administrative stuff. So uh, we so we have the in-class assignment that's going to be due by tomorrow night. I put that all up. Later this week, we'll have another homework assignment for you all to work on. Since you haven't had one in a little while, I wouldn't want you to feel like you're not having to do anything anymore. But I am glad to see all the Discord activity happening. One thing I did want to highlight that I almost forgot about, finally got to this over my office hour, was that I updated the class sessions folder here to actually have some of this code that I'm talking about. And like I said, I am putting up all the Java code in the slides. Um, so if you want those, go ahead and try them out. I'm not going to implement them myself. Again, software engineering is strictly language independent. But if you want to play around with the Python code, I put it all up here. And I should have the, hopefully I've got the links in here. I can't remember if I checked or not. Yeah, like the visitor pattern, I've got the link to where the code actually came from. Um, so you have all of that there for your benefits. So hopefully it's helpful. Um, and if you don't care about Python, feel free to ignore it. <laughs> More of a uh, for your own benefit kind of a thing. So let's talk about visitor. Now, this is where, and if you get lost and confused halfway through, um, either because I'm not explaining it well or you just missed something, keep in mind that the entire purpose of this particular design pattern is to be able to add functionalities to classes that you can't change. And so pretend like you have a Java class or a C Sharp class or Python class, and it is a packaged element, and you can't update it. So what we're going to do with this visitor pattern is we're going to bring in new functionalities. Basically, we're going to we're going to do some trickery, and we're going to add add some extra things here that's going to make this happen. But we're going to bring in new behaviors. We'll bring in new methods. We'll bring in new attributes. We're basically going to augment this class. So think of it kind of like you get a, a component from somewhere and you can't change it, but you want to add new features. That's basically what Visitor does. It allows us to bring in new functionalities. I've got some examples along the way here, which should hopefully be helpful. But this is a behavioral pattern. Again, behavioral. Um, different to structural or creational. Basically, this is the dynamic side of coding. Things are happening at runtime. Um, behaviors are changing. Maybe we need different algorithms. We need different 
methods or behaviors that at design time, you know, at implementation time, we didn't think we needed. Or we did think we needed them, but we're not going to call them directly. <clears throat> this is something that could happen automatically at runtime. You detect a new type of element that you are seeing in, say, like a stream of data coming in. And your existing algorithms can't handle it. Well, what do you do? Well, you use the correct visitor to handle that particular class. You didn't anticipate it coming in at item 5, but you have something which matches, and I'm going to apply my algorithm to that. And where the visitor is coming into play here is that I might have a whole bunch of discrete visitor classes that implement different flavors of an algorithm, for instance. And that's kind of where this data stream example is coming from. So it's behavioral. We are going to perform something on an object structure. Basically, we're going to allow methods to visit a class. <clears throat> and one of my examples later on, it's going to get really confusing, is it's a, um, a course-based example, so like students and teachers and classes. Um, when we start talking about classes and courses, it's going to get all wonky. But bear with me for that one. So the, the key thing here, <clears throat> excuse me, is that we are basically separating out particular operations from a data structure. Again, it gives you the ability to swap in algorithms, to swap in new behaviors, something that can happen at runtime, which you, know, you wouldn't necessarily expect to be able to happen. So nice little throwback here to an ancient Flash game. If any of you ever played The Visitor, I think it was one of those weird point-and-click kind of gory, graphical, graphically gory games. <clears throat> so how do we implement this thing? Again, it is behavioral, so we have to focus on the actual execution that's happening here. What do we, what do we end up doing? We're going to add a visitor class to each data structure. Um, and then for each element, and an element is basically, it's going to be the specific thing that we are dealing with. And again, thing is kind of nebulous here. We're giving it a specific operation. So we have a visitor. The visitor comes in. It's brought in to work on something. And that particular operation will basically be that flavor of the algorithm. <laughs> yeah, I had to do a walkthrough for this game, too. All right, so consequences here. This makes adding new operations very, very easy. Now, I will say there is a lot of overhead with adding the visitor pattern, overhead being some mental hurdles you have to get over, uh, some object-oriented paradigms you have to kind of code in. Like there's this double dispatch idea where you instantiate a class, it has to call its parent class, which calls its parent class, and it gets a little bit convoluted in the, the calling cycle here. But basically, we're just going to iterate over all of these objects that we're defining and call their visit function. And we don't care what that visit function is doing. That's specific to this visitor coming in. It's basically encapsulating an instance of some operation that's happening. So we have a very nice separation of responsibility, basically. Visitors are responsible for themselves. Um, we can also actually add in new attributes and features to the visitors. It, it does get a little bit tricky with encapsulation and who owns what and which classes are tied to which classes. Let me skip ahead here to the UML diagram to show you. But basically what visitor is doing is instead of like having a nice encapsulation where a class is responsible for all these operations, we're yanking out these operations and putting them into visitors. And these visitors, by breaking encapsulation, they become their own atomic objects. Right? They're, they're slightly tied in here. We have um, some generalizations happening here. right? So we have a visitor with specific instances of what this actually is. Right? We have elements that are looking to accept a visitor. So basically, we have some class where we're expecting an algorithm to come in. So we're going to have ways to basically accept the operations they're bringing to the table here. So 
kind of why I jumped to this slide, we're breaking encapsulation, right? Before, all of this would be inside of a single class, perhaps. Now, the downside with doing that and why we're trying to kind of separate things out is we're trying to basically like decouple a lot of our operations here. Whereas if I had, you know, 50, say 50 algorithms I need to implement for a particular program, and instead of having them all be in one giant class, I can split them out into these visitors. I can mix and match. I can add and, and delete them without impacting the entire program. Everything's kind of loosely coupled, right? Changing one specific visit function doesn't impact anybody else. <clears throat> so we can very easily add in new operations, new behaviors, and we don't necessarily have to update everything. The caveat, though, with this is that we have to understand what the algorithms are doing, sorry, what the visit algorithms are doing to the actual classes under, under observation, basically. So there is a tie-in where we have to be able to work on a particular element. We have to know what the attributes are. Uh, we have to know how to handle the data types and what the return values are going to be. <clears throat> we will have a reference to these visitors. So there is some kind of a coupling there, but the benefits kind of outweigh the mental hurdles that we have here. So what else do we have to talk about? I think that's about it. So why would we do this? And again, I'll, I'll come back to this here momentarily. Why add a visitor? Why not just brute force this kind of a thing? Well, consider that you have a general class and it can't really be changed. You can't just bolt on new algorithms and say it's done. Again, consider this to almost be like a package that you're bringing in or a DLL or something of that nature. We want to basically encapsulate it and add our own visit functions to this. So that's one example. Another one is that we want to separate out the algorithms from the objects. So clearly defining responsibilities in our programs. So what do we actually have here? Um, basically what we have going on is that we have a client. I'll, I'll talk about all these momentarily. I've got definitions for what each of these elements means. But basically we have a client which has an object structure that it talks to. And again, this is the, the, like the static class side of things. Um, and then we're going to define an element. Now an element is going to be the aspect to the class that is going to accept all of these other algorithms, right? One of the examples that I've got coming up are reading different types of data files. So like XML or JSON or whatnot. Our class, we don't care what the data type is. We just care that we want to read all these files and get all the data into this object structure. The visitors are going to define read XML, read JSON, read text, read CSV. It's going to all be nicely separated out. So that's kind of the basic element versus visitor here. Now, the, the notion where it makes this interesting is that you have this specialization happening here, right? This is your generalization construct in, in UML. You have a generic element, and it has an accept function. Again, this takes in a list of visitors, basically. We have these concrete elements too, right? So concrete element A and B, concrete visitor one and two. These are basically specializations of what a visitor is. Now you see that we have a visit function for each of them. We have an accept function for each of the, the elements themselves. And to the, the slides in a, a couple of slides, these are called visitables, not elements. It's the same thing. It's just a different figure. I liked this one better um, and I didn't want to make it myself. <laughs> so basically we have something that is to be visited. It's the whole point of this top level here. Everybody gets an accept function. Down here, everybody gets a visit function. And this basically ties who is visiting whom and which um, data types are coming in and going out. The nice thing here <clears throat> is that the client basically just has to call element.accept. Like, it doesn't care what the algorithm is. We get that nice layer of abstraction here. 
So what do all of these mean? And again, I've got client visitor, concrete visitor. Here, this is visitable and concrete visitable. This is a direct relationship to element. So let me, you know, let me maybe change live slide change. Woo! Let's see. Visitable equals element from fig. Here. I know I'm trying to abbreviate things. It's not like URE is a uh, hard thing to type. So we have this. Now, uh, full screen, please. Thank you. So the clients, this is going to be the one that consumes all the classes, right? So it's going to access the data structure. It's going to tell them accept this visitor. Basically, this is kind of your entry point, the client. So this is your basic class here. Now, the visitor, that's your abstract class. It is the one declaring the visit operations. And the concrete visitors, again, these are the ones specializing that. So client sends data to a class, and that class determines which sub, yeah, basically, um, and how it processes that data. It doesn't have to be data either. It can be any kind of action or operation. The data example is just a kind of a nice visual here for this. Yeah, basically, we're just doing some object-oriented trickery to make this happen. OK, so but yeah, that's that's basically how this works here. Um, so the concrete visitor, again, the specialization, different operations. If you're talking about having different sorting algorithms, kind of a standard standard uh, computer science-y kind of thing to do, right? Bubble sort, quick sort, radix sort, any of the sorts, you would have a concrete visitor for each sorting algorithm. And then based on what data is coming in or based on the state, you would use the appropriate visitor there. Again, nicely breaks things, okay, or uh, breaks things apart responsibility-wise, sorry. So then the other side is the visitable, or the elements from the figure. I like element better because it's easier to say over and over again. <laughs> Basically, this is where we define the accept operation. The accept operation is the entry point. So we are going to pass in a visitor to an accept function where when we call accept, it's basically just going to reroute to that visitor's visit function. So let me give you a, an example here. Um, this is going to be in terms of Python. I've also got some Java code, which I'll show you momentarily. But pretend like we are setting up a class responsibility type of environment where you have instructors, you have students. Um, the instructor is going to teach. He's going to be assigned to a class. You know, the teacher will be assigned rights for grading and assignments and all that fun stuff. You know, what instructors do. What do we really do? Uh -huh. The student, then, you can register for classes. You can drop them. Um, you can submit assignments, right? So we, if you're thinking about this from your perspective and my perspective for this class, we have completely different operations that we perform. If you consider us to be like programs, right? And maybe we really are programs. Who knows? <laughs> but we have different attributes, different responsibilities. These boxes here. This is going to be the actual course. This is just from this particular example, but this would be like your CIS 350, your STA 222, your CIS, I don't know, it's classes I'm teaching next semester, whatever computer graphics is. So these are your different, yeah, and I'll come back, different classes, <clears throat> different courses. That's why I said this terminology is going to get wonky on me. Um, but if we're considering these to be like separate entities in a system, how do we know which operations are to be assigned? Right? Like I'm running a, f a simple for loop of setting up classes and setting up, setting up courses and setting up people. How do I know if this particular person is an instructor or a student? How do I know which operations they're allowed to perform? You could do this all in one big massive loop, right? If instructor, then give the ability to do this, 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 and this. Else if student, then do this, 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 and this. Else if auditing person, right? So maybe your faculty member who wants to take a class or your spouse that is just going to sit on or, or something like that. You're going to have different privileges in the system as well, meaning different operations. Now, again, you can do this brute forced, but we get very bad design principles out of that. If you make one change anywhere in the system, you're going to have to update everything else. 
And this is where we get into things like maintenance, um, things like software reuse, where if you start making changes here and there and you start seeing that you have to update all of these other classes, that's very bad for maintenance and reusability. They're very tightly coupled in that example. Whereas the visitor pattern breaks things apart. And I can add right here, get my pointer back, I can add another type of person, right? I can add auditing student. I can add administrator. I can add um, staff or something like that, right? Where everybody has particular responsibilities and, and roles here and they can perform different operations. But by adding them, and this is the key, I don't hurt anything in these classes. I don't hurt anything in these classes. Now, do I have to define a visit and an accept functionality where, yes, we have to accept these different types now? Absolutely. But we're not breaking everything apart. We're just adding a new functionality for basically free, which is kind of nice. The cost is all the extra overhead at the front end. Okay, so hopefully that kind of makes sense. The whole takeaways are trying to make life easier in the long run. That's the thing with design patterns. If you can figure out that you can use them early on, a little bit of extra mental hurdles to get over, you know, a little bit of intelligent design of your programs, and you can save yourself so much time. Um, you start doing things like this, and you start talking about terms like technical debt, where if you put a hack in right now, that's going to cost you 50 weeks of fixing in, in the future. That's the technical debt idea. But if you can kind of elegantly design some of your programs early on, you can save yourself all that later effort. All right, so what are the advantages here? And again, I've got an example, a couple examples here to kind of help you with this. Um, we have this open or close principle. Basically, we can very easily add new operations without changing them, without changing other classes. So basically, this idea of adding a new visitor in, I just have to accept that visitor type. I don't care what it's doing. So my team's calendar application, it could be implemented to determine whether an assignment, event, or course. Yeah, yeah, sure, that'd be a great example. So your main class, so your client class, just loops over all the objects coming in. And based on its type, you'd have a visitor for that, you know, assignment event course. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great example. But again, it, it takes some extra hurdles. You have to implement, sorry, this kind of a thing with that. But I've got some Java and some Python code here, which can hopefully help visualize it. Uh, so what else we can do? Bop, 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 bop. Yeah, so this is all effectively everything that I've already said. So we can add extra entities without hurting your base class. And again, that's one of those maintenance types of things. Only change one class if you're adding new features or new behaviors. Try to minimize changing everything. And again, a lot of these projects are very complicated. There's a lot of classes. There's a lot of relationships happening. They're not all simple three-class types of systems. They're hundreds of classes. <clears throat> so if you can reduce your complexity in any way, that's always a good thing. More or less, I suppose, not always a good thing. Um, yeah, so that's all of that. So there are disadvantages with this too. I'm not trying to paint a completely rosy picture. There are always going to be trade-offs with software engineering. Hopefully you're all getting that by now. Software engineering is the study of trade-offs in engineering, basically. Um, we have to update all of our visitors, or we have to update the visitor when we add a, or remove a class. And all this means is that if we make a change to our system, we have to make sure that that change is noticed by those responsible. So if I'm iterating over a list of visitors, for instance, and I'm trying to call the XML parser visitor, but I took that out, well, your base class is going to break because it doesn't exist anymore, right? So you do have to keep an eye on that. It can also be difficult to extend things as well. So if you start getting a ton of visitors, you can go into the realm of being overcomplicated. So I wouldn't like make this your god class type of thing where this does a million visitors or anything like that. 
um, keep it manageable. That's kind of the takeaway here. Another problem which you may see is a lack of access to particular fields that you need. So let's go back here. Um, and again, we have our courses and we have our people entities. Consider that we may have structured these such that like maybe the course number is private or the instructor's social security number is protected or you know whatever we're doing for data hiding, we may be implementing this in our system here. And if you start breaking things apart, there's a possibility that you have a dependency on a now hidden attribute. Now, is that a problem? Well, not necessarily, right? Maybe you add a get function to whatever class you need it on. You know, maybe you make that public instead of private, or you add a layer of abstraction to talk to another entity. You know, maybe another design pattern on there too. But the key is that if you break things apart and there is a pre existing structure of uh, encapsulation or data hiding, you might have issues with some of your visitors. But that's something to be figured out later. I mean, it's not not a game stop or a, a stopper. Not a, a stumbling block there. That's the word I'm going for. OK, so we're adding in new behaviors to static classes, basically, is the key here. Where can we use this? Um, so the just call me X. I still have to figure out who is who in this class. Um, that example was great if you have different events happening and you have to deal with them as they come in. Um, another great example is like a recursive operation in a way. So if you have a tree or if you have a, a linked list or if you have um, like XML or JSON or something where basically you're looping through recursively to some node or some object, you don't care what algorithm is working on that particular node, right? If it's a stream of data coming in, apply the JSON visitor to this object, apply the XML to this one, or go through your XML tree and parse out each node recursively with the appropriate visitor that can handle that particular node. Again, consider that we're just basically looping over all of our objects and applying the correct visitor to it here. So let me let me show you an example here, and then we'll go into some in-class work. All right, so I've got some Java that I'm going to pop over to here. Um, and this website actually does a really great job of explaining it as well, if you don't like my explanation, which is perfectly fine. Um, but this is nice and simple, honestly. So I just want to kind of show this website off a little bit. All right, so we actually see the same diagram here, which is very helpful. <laughs> Just different colored. But we're, okay, here we go. So here is our base class. So let's consider it to be a document class, right? So a document is being populated by a bunch of objects where these could be XML, could be JSON in this particular example here. So what do we have? The document is extending elements. Right, so here we have our client would basically be document, and then here is our element. Again, our concrete elements, our concrete visitors, these are our specializations here. All right, so we have a list of elements that we're going to deal with. Don't care what they are, they're just some element. Now, we're going to provide an accept function in this class where for every element, we are going to accept the visitor, right? So we are taking in whatever visitor is being applied for this element. <clears throat> and this is where we get into specializing our elements. So here we have JSON element, extends element. We have an accept function for that one. We would have an XML element. We would have, you know, whatever data types we need to handle as a specialization. This is your concrete element here. We're providing the accept function and we're calling its visitors visit function. So hopefully you can kind of see that we're basically doing some basic abstraction in a way. So we have some polymorphism going on with these multiple calls to accept and visit and all that fun stuff. But we don't care what the visitor is, we're just accepting a generic visitor. 
we're going to call its visit function. All right, so what does the element, or sorry, what does the visitor look like? Well, here we have a kind of a generic element visitor where we're going to have specific visit functions in here. Yep, yep, let's do that. Now, you could do concrete visitor for each of these, right? These are basically just kind of aggregating them into one, one class. Apparently, it's mow the lawn day outside. It's really loud. But here we're visiting for an XML element. Here we're visiting for a JSON element. Right? And we are just doing some basic printing here. Obviously, you'd parse XML, you'd parse JSON, you'd parse whatever format you want. Um, but the key is that we're specializing in here. But we don't necessarily care what the visit function is at the element level. right? We don't care what the visit function is at the document level. We care when we get this deep into things. <clears throat> so here's what it would kind of look like from a, a generic demo perspective, right? So we create a, a visitor function, we create a document. We add a bunch of JSON elements, and then we accept it. So basically, we are just going to run through and process each element with its visitor function. So again, we're getting some double dispatch happening here. We've got classes instantiating and calling their parent, calling their parent. And basically, there's a lot of redirection going on here. But not necessarily that hard to implement, which is kind of cool. So definitely, if you're doing things in Java and you want to check out Visitor, check out this website. Pretty helpful. I also have it in Python. Up, up, up. Ah, where'd VS Code go? There we go. Not model V controller, we're not doing that. Um, so I've got the example from, I'm not hiding anything, the, the courses and professor and student example in Python here. It's a little bit different of an implementation, but the idea is the same. So we have our generic courses, we have an accept function. Um, accept is going to basically handle whatever the visitor is bringing in. We have specific functions for each visitor. Um, we're going to create our concrete, concrete um, visitor courses here, visitor classes here. Um, and then we have our generic visitor, or sorry, these are the concrete elements. We have the concrete visitors down here. Sorry about that. Um, but the idea is the same, right? You have your el concrete elements, you have your generic elements, you have your visitor class, you have your concrete visitors, where the concrete visitor defines the particular operations that are happening. Yeah, all these examples have been very simplistic, but the idea is that you could extend them to deeper functionalities, right? Everything I've shown you is like just print out a line, but you'd be doing some kind of processing behind the scenes. So how does this look from a main purpose or a main functionality? So let's instantiate our concrete classes, instantiate our visitors, tie the visitors to the elements. So again, SD, STL, DSA, these are your courses. Um, so these are basically going to have some function that's coming in. <coughs> so, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Frog in my throat. Um, you still have some heavy lifting to do from your perspective as a designer, right? You have to tell each um, element what visitors to accept. And the same idea was here in the Java code as well, over here, where you're telling the document to accept these visitor types, right? So I'm here, accept basically create two new JSON elements and one XML element and parse it out. So you're telling the code, these are the visitors to handle. So you still have some effort here where if you start adding or deleting visitor types, you're going to have to make sure you keep this up to date. But we are doing enough abstraction here that all we're doing is passing in this object and the visitor is going to handle the rest. And so this is wrong shell. 
Yeah, so Python 3, let me bring this up a bit. And this is, again, it's going to be pretty basic what we're doing here. This class is taught by an instructor. It is studied by a student. Same for the other courses here. Now, how does this happen, taught by, studied by? We're not calling any print functions here in our main function, right? We're just saying accept this visitor. And once we accept it, it's going to do whatever it wants to do. But by accepting, say, an instructor, when it gets visited, we're going to say that you're teaching whatever came in. Well, what am I teaching? I'm teaching based on this function. So again, the, the kind of key takeaway here is that you just have a couple layers of indirection. Think of it, if, uh, if this is maybe too easy <laughs> for you, um, you can do this in C as well, C, C++. And you can do this with function pointers. And just to give you a, I keep forgetting to leave images up that I look up in the first class. But if any of you have ever heard of a function pointer before, or if you know C or C++ basically, um, everything has a memory address associated with it, right? So if you have a function, say main or process data, there's going to be a memory address that the computer jumps to to run that code, right? So when I compile this program, you get a list of machine code, which translates to memory addresses. And then at that memory address, you have a list of instructions. Kind of going off the rails here, so stop me if I'm confusing. But let's say that I want to do this visitor notion. Well, what's the visitor in its essence? Well, I'm calling different functions based on what I see. I could be cute in C, and instead of calling the function at this memory address, call this memory address, or call this memory address. That's basically what a function pointer is. So you could be cute in C and actually do this kind of stuff as well. Um, I like to highlight this because not everything is Java or C Sharp. We can do some of these cool activities in the more uh, lower level languages. OK, is everybody on board here? So you've got some Java code. Got some Python code if you want to play around with this. Um, and now what we're going to do is a little bit of group time. So if you pop over to the Discord channels, um, this is going to be one of those. I don't necessarily care which team you're on. Pop into group one, two, three, or four in the section one. <clears throat> hey, we already have somebody there. Yo. Yes, I am cool. <laughs> All right, so here's what I want you to do. Um, in class assignment, you have till tomorrow night to wrap it up if you really want to, but you should be able to get done by the end of class. So I want you to think of how you would make a phone application that is going to change the world of online gaming. You can manage all of your characters, all of your tunes or avatars or whatever you want to call them, for any multiplayer game in one phone application. You start the app. It pulls down all of the data from any account that you've linked. So World of Warcraft, Diablo 3, Grim Dawn. And, um, I've gotten recently hooked on Realm of the Mad God again. So there's that one. Any multiplayer online game where you have a character that you can update stats or put their inventory and all that. This basically gives you a quick look at your character. And you can use this to play around with all your attributes and min-max them to your heart's content outside of the game. So that you have this nifty phone app where you can have all your characters in there. Okay. So what do I want you to do? I want you to come up with two use cases and not like the diagram, just write out how you would use this pattern for this application. So like this is the construct of what I want you to consider. How would you apply an observer pattern? How would you apply a visitor pattern? So you can think of all of these kind of user story-like ideas for this application. What would an observer be useful for here? 
what would a visitor be useful for here? And again, consider, if you don't remember from last time, observer is where you have an object that you're watching. And anytime it changes state, it notifies any observer that is attached to it. And again, visitor, we're bringing in new functionalities, new algorithms, new operations to classes which may be static in nature. So um, do that thing that you do where you know somebody will submit it in Blackboard. Make sure you put everybody's name on it so that I can assign points appropriately. And yeah, any questions, pop it into Twitch or ping me on Discord and I will come and help you there. Keep already talking. Good luck. OK. Any questions at all? I'm torn because my morning class, I made them listen to this while I, uh... yeah, you can, you can have it too. It's lovely. You know, let's try this one. No. Elevator music. Haha. -ha. Yeah, didn't want to show that. <laughs> yeah. You are the first ones to take advantage and game the system here. I love it. Some good answers coming in.
<laughs> yes, because not everybody was here today. You just get up that easy. I mean, come on now. How would you go off and tell everybody else what a jerk I am if I didn't give you reasons to think that? everybody. I'll have a couple minutes before we're done with class, so I will let you hammer that out. it is. Fi world. Neat. Love it. Well done, everybody. Okay. I'm going to call it for today. <laughs> Seasons production. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> Perfect. All right. You all have a wonderful... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you 
You all have a wonderful Wednesday. I will see you all on Friday. And... Oh, yeah. Is it down? Oh, no. Anyway, you all have a wonderful Wednesday. I will... It is Wednesday, right? Okay. See you all Friday. And... Have a good day. Bye, everybody.